सब्सक्राइब टू आर चैनल एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन टू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट फ्रॉम राउज आई ए स्टडी सर्कल ज्वाइन द ओनली ऑफिशियल टेलीग्राम चैनल ऑफ राउज आई ए स्टडी सर्कल टू गेट द रेलिवेंट मटीरियल्स एंड इम्पॉर्टेंट अपडेट्स हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द डेली न्यूज सिंप्लीफाइड द वॉट वाई एंड हाउ और द न्यूज पेपर अनालिस ऑन द सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन परस्पेक्टिव टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द हिंदू डेली एडिशन डेटेड ट्वेल्थ ऑगस्ट ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू The topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on your screen, and the timestamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. Before proceeding towards our today's session's discussion, let us first see the question for the weekly answer writing practice. The question is: Critically analyze the Supreme Court judgment, which upheld the wide powers provided to Enforcement Directorate to investigate money laundering cases. This is a long question. and hence you have to answer it within the word limit of 250 words you have to submit your answers on the elearn platform so that you can get the quality evaluation which can help you to gain experience and help further in writing better answers so this topic has appeared at page number 16 and is in relation to the recent amendment which was passed by lok sabha in the context of the wildlife protection act The topic reads that the chairman of the parliamentary standing committee Jairam Ramesh has opposed the provisions of the wildlife bill as far as the syllabus is concerned this topic falls under the general studies paper 3 section in the sub section of the biodiversity and environment and the micro section mentions the conservation of the natural environment so in this very regard today we are going to discuss that what are the recent amendments of the wildlife protection act what are the basics of the wildlife protection act the amendments which are suggested and the concerns which are there in this regard so now without wasting any time let us begin our discussion first of all all of us know that wildlife protection act 1972 was enacted with certain objectives there were certain specific tasks which were laid down for example the wildlife protection act 1972 was enacted in order to protect the wild animals as well as plants now this is very important most of the students restrict the wildlife protection act only to the wildlife animals and they tend to forget the plants aspect it is to be remembered here that wildlife protection act deals with the animals as well as the plants second in order to protect them the wildlife protection act 1972 lays down elaborate provisions with regard to the management of their natural habitat it provides the legal framework to govern or to demarcate the national parks wildlife sanctuaries community reserves as well as conservation reserves so now again here an important thing is that there are four types of protected areas which wildlife protection act talks about and here we do not find the reference of biosphere reserves here we find national parks wildlife sanctuaries community reserves as well as conservation reserves then the third important component is that this act also talks about the regulation and control of the trade in the wild animals now this is very important because it might happen that interpreting this particular act in the narrow domains that it is only restricted to the protection and conservation of the wildlife animals and plants it might happen that we think that it will not be dealing with the trade aspect but it has to deal with the trade aspect the reason being that illicit trade in the wildlife is very prominent and it needs to be stopped and that is why if you have to protect the wildlife you also have to regulate the trade and that is why the control of trade in wild animals plants their parts and products is also dealt by the wildlife protection act and the fourth important sub component of this act is that this act specifically deals with the tiger it provides statutory guidelines for the framework of the national tiger conservation authority that is ntca and it also deals with the tiger reserves so these are the four important objectives or components of the wildlife protection act 1972 but as you all know since 1972 around 50 years have been passed and a lot of changes have taken place in terms of economy in terms of technology in terms of organized crime also and and that is why the acts which deal with the wildlife conservation protection their preservation etc need to be reformed and in this very regard certain amendments have been proposed 
in the wildlife protection act so in this line now we will look that what are the key amendments which were proposed in this act the first and the foremost amendment is that the amendment bill 2021 aims to amend the preamble of the wildlife protection act 1972 earlier the wildlife protection act 1972 used to deal only with the protection aspect now this amendment particularly wants to explicit the conservation as well as management of the wildlife protection in addition to the protection so conservation aspect as well as management aspect earlier also in 1972 act obviously for protecting any wildlife we need to focus on conservation as well as management also but in this amendment the conservation and management these two words have been explicitly provided in order to increase the stakes of conservation principles as well as management principles along with the protection principles so all these three things will go hand in hand the second important amendment which has been done by this bill is that it aims to create the standing committee for the state board for wildlife the wildlife protection act 1972 does not provide for this committee and that is why this amendment in order to have a decentralized conservation efforts aims to create this particular body it also says that this body will be headed by the state minister of forest or wildlife and will also have 10 members in it the third important amendment in this regard is that it also aims to rationalize the schedules of the wildlife protection act 1972 So the 1972 Act has six schedules. Most of you might have read about it also, but this amendment bill aims to reduce the schedule from six to just three schedules. The first schedule will be containing the wildlife species, the wildlife animal species, which requires highest degree of protection. Schedule two will be composed of those species which require relatively lesser degree of protection, and schedule three will be. specifically dedicated to wildlife plants fourth amendment is that all of us know that for example when whenever we have to create let's say national parks wildlife sanctuaries etc we need to acquire certain lands then there is also a displacement of the population and similarly for example if we have to lay down let's say railway tracks or we have to build express way there also we have to do land acquisition so what this particular amendment bill aims to do is that it aims to make the land acquisition and rehabilitation process at par with the land acquisition rehabilitation and resettlement act of 2013 that is LAWR so that is why it will turn the amounts of the compensation which is provided to the forest dwellers the rights which are provided to them and all those things the thing is that this amendment bill aims to ensure compliance with the LARR act also explicitly inserts the provisions to enable the control of invasive alien species now what are these invasive alien species there are certain species which are alien that is from the foreign land the foreign land obviously here does not connotate with the political aspect that is it should not be only from the foreign country the foreign land here is that which is not from the natural habitat so for example let's say there is one particular species a which is found in forests now from those forests if you translocate that species and you try to accommodate that species let's say in different ecosystem for example deserts it will be having a disastrous impact on the local environment or on that species also so that is why it aims to restrict or control the invasive alien species and the last important amendment is that it includes a separate new chapter 5b for the proper implementation of the provision of the sites the convention which deal with the international trade of endangered species so these are certain key amendments which are provided by the wildlife protection amendment bill 2021 and these amendments can also be used by you as merits because because we can see that all these amendments aim to fulfill certain good objectives in order to conserve manage and protect the wildlife but then 
obviously there are certain issues as well we need to be aware about the concerns which are related to this particular amendment bill in this very regard let us see the important concerns the first thing is yes we have discussed that it aims to control the invasive alien species but we also discussed that the concept of invasive alien species is not restricted to the political boundary let's say even within india also if you are translocating one particular species let's say from this area towards this area it might be an invasive alien species for this habitat but this particular amendment bill only talks about the invasive alien species which are from the international boundaries they do not talk about the national invasive species that is within the one country second yes we have discussed that in order to have decentralized conservation and management of the wildlife the standing committee at the state levels were created but the issue is that this body have domination of the official members and it lacks the representation of the specialists and environmentalists moreover because it is headed by the state minister of environment or wildlife several experts believe that this body will eventually turn out to a mere rubber stamp the third important thing is that in order to uphold the equity principles the amendment bill provides ease of access to the drinking and the household water for the local communities but then because there are not adequate safeguards several experts believe that there will be huge chances of the misuse also for example let us assume a situation that in certain specific forest area in order to have a drinking water the family can dug a borehole and then it can also start trading of that water but on the face of it that water is being dug because of the drinking purposes so because of the absence of certain regulatory procedures there are chances of misuse then comes the fourth concern yes we talked that this amendment bill talks about the rationalization of the schedules and reducing the number of schedules from 6 to 3 but then there are certain issues behind the transparency behind the species which are to be included in which schedule it was found that there are certain species which were missing from all the three schedules there were certain species which should be in schedule 1 but they were in schedule 2 that is they were misplaced and third there was unscientific restructuring of the schedule 1 and schedule 2 the experts have said that it was found that just to ensure that it is easy to read and look up the species were put in a schedule in the alphabetical manner now this is purely unscientific the next important concern is related to the transfer of the live elephants the approved bill allows the transfer and the transport of the elephants for religious or any other purposes now this article specifically says that when the recommendations were provided for this bill it was written that only for the religious purposes certain institutions can transfer or transport the elephants but this bill says that for religious or any other purposes now this is very broad as well as vague and the last issue is that this bill is silent on the human animal conflict now human animal conflict is one of the most pressing concerns which hinders the effective wildlife conservation as well as its management but this bill is silent on the rising human animal conflict so these are certain concerns which must be taken care of and now let us revise this topic in brief once again going with all the features which we have discussed so initially we discussed that the wildlife protection act was having four important components that it aimed to protect the wildlife animals as well as plants it provided four protected areas it also dealt with the regulation and the control of the trade in wildlife species and it has a specific focus towards the tiger conservation establishing the national tiger conservation authority in this very line we came across certain amendment features which this bill aims to bring first is amendment of the preamble and taking the conservation and management principles along with the protection principles second was creating the standing committee for state board for wildlife which is to be headed by the state minister and will be having 10 members the third was 
rationalization of the wildlife schedules, reducing its number from 6 to 3. The fourth was ensuring the compliance with the Land Acquisition and Rehabilitation Act. The fifth was specifically dealing with the invasive alien species. And the sixth was a specific chapter for proper implementation of the sites convention. And in the last we discussed certain concerns. The first concern was irrational division between the national and international invasive species. The second issue was that the standing committee will be reduced to a mere rubber stamp. The third concern was that there are high chances of misuse of the water resources in the protected areas. The next concern was related to the irrationalization of the schedules that is inclusion and exclusion errors of the wildlife species in these schedules. The fifth was specifically dealing with the transfer of the live elephants from one place to another and what institutions or which individuals have the power to do so. And the last concern was that this bill is silent on the rising human-animal conflict. So these are all the important dimensions, the features as well as concerns associated with the Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill 2021. Moving with our next topic, this topic has appeared at page number 14 and the topic is in relation to the UNMOGIP. This stands for United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan. The context of this very news article is that the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has appointed Rear Admiral Guillermo Pablo Rios of Argentina as the head of the mission on chief military observers for UNMOGIP. Now this development again becomes very important and is significant as far as the bilateral relations of India and Pakistan and the associated tensions on the line of control is concerned. However, in this very context, the important fact is that India believes that this particular organization has outlived its importance and it should be dissolved. In this very regard, we shall look that how this particular body came into being, what was its evolution, what is the official stand of India, official stand of Pakistan, as well as the official stand of United Nations Security Council. So the story goes back to the Indian Independence Act of 1947. As we all know that earlier, the present day India and Pakistan were united and they were a single country, India. But in 1947, there was a partition and the Indian Independence Act allowed the Kashmir area to join any of the two countries. That is, Kashmir was either free to join India, it was also free to join Pakistan, or it was also given the power to remain independent. But as we all know that eventually Kashmir signed the instrument of accession with India and this became the root cause of the Kashmir conflict between India and Pakistan. In this very regard, almost a year later, for the mediation of this particular dispute in January 1948, the United Nations Security Council adopted the resolution and it established one body, that is United Nations Commissions for India and Pakistan, UNCIP. The main task of this body was to investigate and mediate this particular dispute. And on the basis of the recommendations of the UNCIP, the Secretary General appointed the military advisor. The task of this military advisor was to support the commission, that is UNCIP, on the military aspects and provided for a group of military observers to assist him. And the first team of these military observers arrived at the site in 1949 and thereby the main task of it was to supervise the ceasefire between India and Pakistan. Now this is very important. The first team of the military observers arrived to supervise the ceasefire between India and Pakistan and to assist the military advisor to UNCIP. However, a caution was laid down that any direct intervention by the observers between the opposing parties that is India and Pakistan was to be avoided. After this, there are two important agreements which changed the game altogether. The first was the 
Karachi Agreement of 1949. This Karachi Agreement particularly specified that UNCIP would station the military observers wherever it deemed necessary and that the ceasefire line would be verified mutually on ground by local commanders of India and Pakistan that is on each side with the assistance of these military advisors. If there is any disagreement between India and Pakistan that has to be referred to the UNCIP military advisor and their decision will be final. So what are the important things in this? There are two things. One, it was related to the ceasefire between India and Pakistan because this military observer group was to supervise this particular ceasefire. And then the Karachi agreement of 1949 specified that that ceasefire would be mutually verified by the opposing parties and if there are any disagreements that has to be referred to the commission. But after this, the Shimla agreement came. In 1972, post Shimla agreement, because there were alterations in the line of control, in 1971, as we all know that there was a Bangladesh Liberation War and it led to the conflict between India and Pakistan also. So that is why there were certain changes on the line of control in the Kashmir. And then a new ceasefire with certain deviations was laid down. And that is why after this post Shimla agreement, the opinions of Pakistan and India got differed. Till the Shimla agreement, India and Pakistan were following this particular military observer group. But later on, there were divergent positions between India and Pakistan. India says that because now the Karachi agreement is over and now it is the time of post Shimla agreement period. And that is why the UNMOGIP's role was overtaken by the Shimla Agreement of 1972. However, on the contrary, Pakistan does not accept the Indian argument and it continues to seek the cooperation from UNMOGIP. And now the present situation is that if there is any ceasefire violation from Indian side, then Pakistan report it to the UNMOGIP. On the contrary, if there is any ceasefire violation from the Pakistan, then India does not report it to the UNMOGIP. We give the answers in our own way. And that is why military authorities of India have lodged no complaints since January 1972, limiting the activities of the UN observers on the Indian administered side of the line of control. The official stand of the United Nations Security Council is that in the view of the difference of the opinions between the two countries, the UN has maintained that UNMOGIP could be dissolved only with a decision from the United Nations Security Council. That means UNSC has also hinted towards the dissolution of this particular body, but the decision has to be taken from the council itself. This topic has appeared at page number 18 and is in relation to the recent novel virus which has appeared in China and is again in news in the form of zoonotic diseases. The virus is named as Langya virus. In this line, we shall discuss certain key facts which are in public domain as far as this virus is concerned. Because this virus is a new virus and hence the studies and researches are still going on and that is why we do not have much information about these viruses. But the information which we still have is in front of you. First of all, what exactly is the Langa virus? The studies conclude that Langa virus is a phylogenetically distinct Henipa virus. Now, what is this Henipa virus? These are generally bat driven viruses, that is, the natural hosts of most of these viruses are bat. For example, Nipah, which you all might have heard about, is a Henipa virus. The other viruses are like Hendra, Mojiang, etc. Now, as far as the symptoms of Langa viruses are concerned, it is still on the basis of the studies which are still going on. There were around 35 to 36 patients which felt prey of this Langa virus. And when the medical examinations on those patients were conducted, it was found that most of the patients were facing fever, fatigue, cough, nausea, headache and vomiting. Another complex thing which was associated with these patients was 
that most of these patients were also having several disorders in their critical organs for example for example many of the patients were having problem in their liver function kidney function they were having low platelet counts and there was a drastic fall in their white blood cells the low platelet counts are known as thrombocytopenia and the fall in the white blood cells is called as leukopenia now the question arises that where has langya virus come from now most of the studies have concluded that it has jumped from an animal to the humans that means it is a zoonotic in nature now most of the zero surveys which are conducted have found that shrews are the natural host of these viruses among other domestic animals goats and dogs are also being studied and as i have said that studies are still going on but these are the certain key facts which have come in the public domain now this topic has appeared at page number 1 and is in relation to the sanctions which are posed on the terrorist groups or the individual terrorists the topic reads india has slammed china for blocking the move against jaish e mohammed deputy chief who is known as rauf ashkar this is the very context of this article also that recently china has opposed the joint initiative of india as well as usa to list jaish e mohammed deputy chief rauf ashgar as a united nations security council designated terrorist china has put a technical hold on the process and this has been criticized by india as well as us india has called it as politically motivated and as the evidence of china's double speak on pakistan based terrorism in this very regard let us look at certain key facts related to the unsc counter terrorism committee the counter terrorism committee is a 15 member committee and is a subsidiary body of the unsc that is united nations security council post 911 attack on usa the unsc adopted a resolution 1373 according to this resolution all the states have to criminalize the assistance for terrorist activities they have to deny the financial support to those terror groups or individual terrorists and they also have to curtail the safe havens which are provided by certain countries to the terrorists and along with this they have to share all the information related to the terror groups which are planning certain terrorist activities here it should be remembered that counter terrorism committee is not a sanction body nor does it maintains a list of terrorist groups or individuals now this key fact is very important it is not a sanctions body and it does not maintain the list of terrorist groups so now we will go towards its evolution and certain key resolutions there are four important resolutions in this regard first is the resolution 1988 adopted in 2011 Resolution 1989 again in 2011. Next is Resolution 2253 in 2015 and Resolution 2368 in 2017. Now all these resolutions deal with different categories or different groups. Now this one deals basically with the Al Qaeda, that is the terrorist organization, and is also known as Al Qaeda Sanctions Committee. with the adoption of these resolutions the security council decided that the list of the individuals as well as entities will be split in two groups one was specifically for the al qaeda and it was known as al qaeda sanctions committee and the 1988 which was adopted in 2011 was associated with the taliban group and that was in order to ensure the peace stability and security in afghanistan Similarly in 2015 the security council adopted the resolution 2253 and it was dealing with the islamic state in iraq and levant that is isil similarly in 2017 resolution 2368 was adopted this was again related to the isil as well as the al qaeda sanction list but with the adoption of this resolution the security council reaffirmed the assets freeze travel ban and arms embargo affecting all the individuals and entities on the isil al qaeda sanction list so this one is general in sense others were 
particular instance. So all these are under the sanctions 1, 2, 6, 7. Now this is very important. There can be questions on prelims that sanctions 1, 2, 6, 7 deals with which of the following things. So this was a very brief topic mainly relevant from the prelims examinations perspective. So now is the time for the question of the day. The question from last DNS was related to the Indian constitution. The question asked which of the following articles of the Indian constitution does not deal with the welfare of the scheduled tribe population in India. For this specific question option D that is article 51 is the correct answer because article 51 forms the part of the directive principles of state policy and it deals with the international peace. The question from today's DNS is Recently, Langya virus has been reported in which of the following countries? Option A, China, B, Bolivia, C, Egypt, or D, Ghana. So that's all for today. All the very best and study hard.